let's talk about what I like to call the big three learning theories. There are three learning theories that you'll hear referred to more than any others in instructional design, and they're all a pretty good example of what you can expect from learning theories in general. So let's go ahead and do a summary of these, and I'll talk about some examples for each as well. Uh, let's start with a quick recap or mini discussion on how people learn. If you're really interested in a really wonderful graphical guide to how people learn, Julie Dirksen, D-I-R-K-S-E-N, wrote this wonderful primer. It's a book called Design for How People Learn, and it's a really nice little crash course with a lot of illustrations and examples on how people learn. Highly recommend this text. But in general, how people learn is, is pretty similar person to person because our brains develop uh, pretty much the same way. Uh, so learning styles are not a thing, but learning experiences, uh, when you design them, you might shape them by individual preferences as well as disability. So someone might have a preference in how they learn, and if they have a disability, that needs to be uh, part of the design process as well. Method of instruction, how someone is going to learn something, how it's set up, should also depend on what is being taught and how it is being taught. So some examples of this would be math. If you're teaching someone to do long division, they're not going to learn how to do it on their own just by watching somebody else do it. They might start the learning experience by seeing someone else do an example, but unless you actually practice doing math yourself, it's not something that you're just going to pick up out of the air. It's a skill that you have to practice over and over and over. Uh, that's an example of um, active learning as well. Generally an experience needs to be an active learning experience for it to actually have an effect on the learner and for them to actually master the skill and incorporate it into long-term memory. So always think about what's being taught and how it's being taught. Um, it can vary based on the subject at hand. As I just mentioned, learning experiences are always more effective when learners and active are and engaged. It's not to say that you don't learn anything from a lecture, okay? You can learn lots of stuff from lectures. There's a reason colleges have been doing it for a very long time. There is a learning effect that comes from lectures but it's not the best learning experience. It's a passive learning experience, and the learner, after watching a lecture, has to go back to their notes and really engage with the material themselves in an active way for that material to really stick in their minds. So one way or the other, there always needs to be some sort of active experience in a learning experience for it to be effective. And I wanna throw in that feedback is critical to the learning process. There's Nothing worse than, than mislearning something and no one ever telling you that you didn't get it right. And that's one of the big challenges with the traditional learning model, again with college, is that if you didn't learn something correctly and it comes to the midterm and you feel confident and you answer the questions on the midterm, but you answer them terribly incorrectly when you think they're correct, and it's a big blow when you get a very poor grade back on that midterm because you had a passive experience up until that point in the semester and you're kind of trying to teach yourself the material from the lectures and no one ever you know was able to give you that feedback that you mislearned something and that's not to say that an instructor or the professor is always going to be the responsible one for correcting mislearnings there's lots of ways to uh, incorporate peer feedback and other activities and even individual activities so that you can get feedback but feedback is always going to be critical to the learning process to not only avoid mislearning something but also to reinforce when you do get something right all right, so there's this online book called Foundations of Learning and Instructional Design Technology. It's a free online ebook. Um, it's very, very, very robust, a little bit wordier than I, I would like to um, usually refer people to, but it is free online and has good information. And I'm going to use it to as a resource today for uh, the learning theories I'm going to discuss. When I talk about learning theories, yes, the word is theory, but there's a scientific meaning to the word theory. Learning theories are a source of verified instructional strategies, tactics, and techniques. This is uh, information from that ebook there. The important word here is verified. There's been a lot of science, there's been a lot of studies, and learning theories are not just theories, they're explanations for how people learn. 
Learning theories are a great place to get ideas on how to provide instruction. Uh, they do provide the foundation for strategy selection. So when you're thinking about who your learner is, what you want to teach them, how you're going to teach them, whatever that thing is, a learning theory can help point you in the right direction. So the big three, here are the big three learning theories that you just hear about again and again in instructional design. You have behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. And I, again, I think the reason that these three are kind of the ones you hear a lot is that they're all very different from one another. And they're a really good launching point for understanding other learning theories that might be variations of these. So let's dive in to what each of these is. Behaviorism. Remember Pavlov's dogs? That's the perfect example of behaviorism. They were trained to drool when a bell rang. They got this input over and over and over, and eventually they started thinking that food was coming when a bell rang, so they would start drooling when a bell rang, even though technically the bell has nothing to do with the food, right? So basically there's this input, they're trying to reach this output, and they achieve that they connected drooling to a bell rather than drooling to food through the use of behaviorist techniques. Now, that's not to say that we're going to treat your learners like Pavlov's dogs, but again, this theory can be the source of some good strategies for instruction, depending on your learner and certain topics. Now, how this treats the mind, the human mind, besides dogs, it treats it basically like a black box. We don't really care what's going on in the mind. We just care about getting the right input to get the right output that we want, okay? So only the input and the output matter. We don't care what's going on in the mind. We just want to figure out what that right input is to get what we want out of the mind. So the idea is you do the right input and you reinforce the behaviors that you want to see, maybe guide them over time until you get the output desired. This sounds very dehumanizing, and it is. When you explain it this way, the mind doesn't really matter. Again, it's a launching point for strategies for instruction and does have um, a place in uh, learning as well. And where that place is, is often basic information or maybe use for children. So memorizing definitions, recalling basic information. A lot of the time in a learning experience, you need to have a foundational knowledge of what the terms are you need to know, of what the basic facts are, before you can build on those to really engage with the information. If you're brand new to a subject, you kind of need to know what the terminology is before you can really absorb the information, grapple with the information, and build on what you're learning. So think the building blocks of learning for behaviorism. So think spelling tests too for small kids. We don't really care that they know what the word means, we just care that they know how to spell it. So that's an example of a behaviorist learning technique. Then later on, once they know how to spell the word, they can start writing short paragraph sentences using that word and building on their understanding of that word. So behaviorism has its place in uh, instructional design and it's a good launching point for, for some instruction. So that brings us to cognitivism. Cognitivism is very concerned about what's going on in the mind, but it says the mind is like a computer. A person comes to any learning experience with their own full, rich life, their own lived experiences, their own expectations and existing understandings. And cognitivism is all about structuring a learning experience to fit in kind of with where a person is already at. The learner is active and engaged in the learning process with this theory. Learning is not something that's like being done to them. It's not just an input and an output. A learning experience is designed to kind of meet a learner where they are and help build them up into the learning experience that we, we want them to have. In this theory, learning activity should be chunked and designed in a way to facilitate processing by the learner. Uh, if you have some pre-existing knowledge of instructional design, think learning objectives and backward design. Think about where you want someone to be. Say you want them to be able to um, explain the meaning of the Declaration of Independence and think about how you would structure a learning experience to get them there. They would have to know, first off, that the United States was a thing. Um, they would have to know that the United States first saw independence in, I don't know, was it 1774? Um, they would have to know about the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence. They would have to know who the United States was uh, looking to declare independence from. 
before they could explain what the meaning is of the Declaration of Independence, potentially, okay? So you have that kind of building up experience where you might use behaviorist techniques to help someone get the basic understanding for this point in history, and then you'd build them up through successive activities so they could explain the meaning of the Declaration of Independence. So you kind of know where you want them to be, and then you have to kind of figure out how to get them there. So that's what cognitivism is all about. Uh, if you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, uh, he said that there are six levels of cognitive learning, starting with the very basics, again, like behaviorism, uh, recalling information, defining terms, and then it goes up from there. We'll come back to this. All right. That brings us to the third learning, learning theory. This one's kind of trickiest to explain. This one's called constructivism. And in this theory, learners create meaning from experience. So you have behaviorism, which is the input and output matter. Cognitivism, where the mind's kind of like a computer and you're kind of trying to structure a learning experience to kind of work with how the mind works. Constructivism really puts the learner front and center and kind of treats learning as more subjective. So it's not just like an objective experience that's happening to somebody or even is like uh, designed for processing by them. It's something that they have to kind of like do for themselves. See my bullet points are out of order here. But each mind in this one constructs its own unique reality. Learning is not objective. And learning must occur in context. There's a really nice quote here from that ebook. Learners are encouraged to construct their own understandings and then to validate through social negotiation these new perspectives. So they approach a topic, the learner has to be extremely active in this uh, learning theory scenario. They have to figure out what the topic is and then start validating through social negotiation these new perspectives. What, what do I mean by that? Think apprenticeships, Montessori-style education, experiential learning. I talked already about feedback in the learning process and how critical it is to avoid mislearnings and to reinforce proper learning of whatever the topic is. Constructivism is basically all about that. You have an apprenticeship, you're learning something, say, on the job, say you're shadowing a carpenter, uh, the master carpenter's uh, teaching you how to do things, and then they're going to let you try, and then they're going to correct any mistakes that you make or help you avoid those mistakes. So it's in context. You can't just watch someone do carpentry and figure out how to do it yourself. You have to really get hands-on. Again, it's all about being active in the learning experience, and you're going to construct your own understanding of how carpentry works. And once you become... Uh, a master carpenter, you're going to be so knowledgeable that you'll be able to create new things and creative things out of your really deep understanding of, uh, you know, the materials and how to join them and how to shape them and how to put everything together. So again, think hands-on learning, experiential learning in context. And I would say that this is probably the hardest theory to put into place, especially when you're doing online learning, because it does require really careful facilitation. So think about apprenticeship, you always have like a master that's helping guide the learning experience, usually one-on-one. -on -one. Montessori, you're going to have a low uh, teacher to student ratio, so that there's always someone there guiding you through and making sure that you are on the right path to learning. Experiential learning, there's always going to be some expert there that's helping guide you through. So this is a really labor-intensive style of learning. It is uh, another useful learning theory to think about, though, when you're designing learning experiences. This would be more like maybe a, a capstone project if you had kind of a big curriculum where someone might work one-on-one -on -one with like a professor in a graduate program, for example, um, or learn the bas basics on their own and then go on to work with an expert. So I tend to think of constructivism as being kind of like something that builds on cognitivism. And cognitivism, to me, is something that kind of can build on behaviorism, or behaviorism could even kind of like be incorporated into cognitivism. Anyways, there's, there's overlaps and connections between all three learning theories. And again, they are all just good kind of jumping off points, uh, sources for strategies, sources for thinking about how to design instruction, uh, ways of thinking about how to help people learn, how to facilitate learning, because that's really what instructional design is all about. We are designers creating a learning experience and trying to facilitate learning. Again, there's no one perfect theory. These are the big three you'll see over and over in instructional design. There's tons more theories. There tends to be a lot of overlap. Um, there's theories that branch off from these. There's some that are different altogether. There's a fascinating world of theories. Again, they all have science behind them, and they're wonderful explanations of how people learn. And while people in general kind of learn the same way because their brains develop the same way, preferences matter, 
the topic at hand matters, the method of instruction matters. So it's just a way of starting to think about how to design instruction and who your learners are, what theories might apply to them. Uh, how this learning experience fits into a larger learning experience also matters. It might be that you start with behaviorism again to teach the basic terms. Uh, you build on top of that knowledge with cognitivism and then you move them on to constructivist learning experience. It depends on who your learner is, what they should be able to do after the experience, and kind of what the larger goal here is.